Hi folks, welcome to Black Gumbo Southern Gardening. How about a 2019 spring and summer garden review? We're gonna look at everything we did and all the things we've learned and all the mistakes we've made. Let's go. <music> Well, 2019, this has been an interesting gardening year. I'm sitting out here in my garage. It's uh, 91 degrees and it's hot, but it's not so hot that I can't sit out here and give you an update. But it is so hot these days that gardening has slowed down and for all practical purposes come to a, a close for the next couple of months. So I'm sitting here in my fan. You probably hear the hum of the fan, but what's been going on? A lot of you have asked me for updates. Hey, how's your eggplant doing? What happened to your squash? How, how about those pumpkin pits? Let's talk about all that stuff today. 2019 has been a, a challenging year. It's been a very good year. One of the things that it's been noted for is, uh, in, in, at least in my, my experience, my opinion, is this is the year my YouTube channel took off. And so I'm very grateful for all of you who have subscribed to my channel. I've got 21,000 subscribers when I started the year with a little bit less than 3,000, I believe. So that's a that's phenomenal growth, and I'm so encouraged, and uh, I appreciate it. So, but with 20,000 people out there wanting to know what's going on, I need to give you an update. So, um, yeah, my eggplant. I, I've planted a lot of things this year. All my videos in the spring uh, showed you how to plant eggplant, how to plant zucchini, how to plant a pumpkin pit, how to plant cucumbers, and all these things. And 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 I've showed you. If you've watched my channel, you've seen these things uh, as, I've, as, I've, as I've walked through my garden or given you a tour or I've reported on some problem or some bug or something or other. You've seen them, but I haven't explicitly told you how everything turned out. So that's what I'm going to do today. I planted eggplant in containers and the eggplant currently are sitting in my backyard at about three and a half to four feet tall. I've got two plants and I harvested two fruits off of each plant. However, I did not harvest them in time. I thought they would get bigger, but they didn't. They grew to their full size and they were nice and glossy and beautiful. But when I harvested them, they had turned a little bit uh, matte colored. And you know, if or I didn't know, but now I do, that when you harvest eggplant, you want to harvest them when they're still glossy. Otherwise you get the big seeds forming on the inside. And that's how you know that you've waited too long is that the seeds, uh, the skin of the eggplant turns kind of, uh, kind of matte it's not quite as glossy and that's what happened to me so I had seeds in my eggplant so my eggplant went to compost with the seeds um, I've got blossoms on my eggplant and hopefully they'll give me some more and I'll harvest them uh, sooner uh, I planted zucchini in pots as well I had two zucchini plants and they succumbed to spider mites which knocked them all the way back to the ground level they grew back, but they grew back, it was already late in the season, and so I only got a, a couple of zucchinis off of my zucchini plants before the heat and the vine borers killed them. But um, they grew really lush, really help, uh, healthy. I had tons of blossoms, most of them were all male blossoms, and that's the problem that I had, is uh, you know sometimes you don't get the kinds of blossoms you need. They grew, grew really well, and I was able to uh, teach how to eradicate uh, spider mites with uh, my zucchini plants being an integral part of that problem and so but uh, so I count my zucchini as success because I was able to learn and was able to demonstrate planting and potting but I didn't get to demonstrate harvesting and cooking so peppers I planted all kinds of peppers this year mostly my my plants that I put in pots this year and some of the ones I put in the ground were purchased plants. They were Bonnie plants from the big box store because I didn't start seeds this year. Uh, the, the, the real life got in the way of me being able to start seeds this year. And so all my plants were the typical varieties that you can get down at the big box store. My peppers, however, have done really well. I've grown uh, cayenne peppers, garden chili peppers, serrano peppers, bell peppers, ancho peppers, and bird peppers and longhorn pepper, all kinds of peppers. And I actually made some cayenne pepper powder just today uh, in my new coffee grinder that grinds this, this pepper to a, uh, a very fine powder. So I was able to actually produce some things uh, that I wanted to produce from my pepper plants. Pepper plants almost never give me trouble. What I've discovered over the years though is that a pepper grown in a pot or a container will produce for you, but a pepper grown in the ground will get at least in my in my climate and in my soil at least twice as big and will produce more for you. 
One year I had Tabasco pe peppers that produced all summer long, all winter long, and into the next spring. And so um, I think I'm going to stick to planting peppers in the ground if I really want to produce peppers for use. If I want to demonstrate, I have to admit, a lot of what I plant is to demonstrate the technique and I don't really expect a big harvest. I mean, if you want a big harvest of okra, you don't plant just a few pots of okra like I did. But uh, yeah, the okra is doing well. The okra is the, the subject of a test I'm doing between fetid fertilizer, that awful anaerobic brew that I'm making out of weeds, and I've got a video that will show you that, uh, and fish emulsion. And so far, I can't see any difference between the two. Both fertilizers are behaving uh, exemplary, and both are performing well. So I will probably do a wrap-up video of my fish fertilizer versus fetid brew uh, in the future. I'm not sure how long in the future. I'm already eating okra and I'm harvesting okra enough for me to eat uh, a couple of meals every now and then. So uh, that's encouraging. The okra varieties are very delicious too. These red okras, man, I love them. They're beautiful. They're pretty much pest-free and trouble-free and they grow through the summer. So what else? The tomatoes. My tomatoes were the subject of my amino pyrrolid disaster this year, and I'll talk about that on its own in a moment. But tomatoes, most of my tomatoes were wiped out, so I didn't get any good tomatoes. All I got were the ones I put in pots this year. And the ones I put in pots almost never perform, just like peppers, they don't, they don't perform as well as tomatoes in the ground for me. I did pot uh, Julie, Juliet little, little cherry tomatoes that look like miniature Romas. And I've commented every time I've mentioned Juliet's that I don't like them too much. They, they make good stir-fry tomatoes, but the skins of those Juliet's are so thick, I just don't like them. Uh, I won't grow them again. But they are profuse, and even in the heat of the summer, while the plants look like they're dried twigs, they're still pushing out tomatoes. So in terms of productivity, the Juliet's been impressive, and I can recommend it if you just need a, a, a tomato to be summer resistant. It's a pretty good tomato. Nice little hybrid there. Uh, zucchini, I talked about that. Beans, I planted, I planted several kinds of beans this year. I had a hard time starting beans because the beans were uh, from seed that were old seed. And so all my long beans, I had to start them several times over and they didn't get going until the summer really kicked in. Once I got my bean vines up some posts, they've been putting on long beans for me and I've been harvesting a whole lot of beans so uh, my green beans haven't done as well because I haven't really tended and cared for them as much as I should be they were really an afterthought I planted them in a bed that I was remediating uh, weeds in and so I, I think that's not an optimal condition for them I haven't given them much thoughts so really and haven't really talked about them in my channel so I really can't uh, update you much because I never really mentioned the beans the green beans Cowpeas. I love cowpeas. I've been growing cowpeas as a cover crop and as a as an eating crop, and all my cowpeas are doing fantastic. They always do. In fact, uh, I just went out and looked at my cowpeas, the ones I, I broadcast spread last week, and uh, they're doing fine. They're coming up looking good, and the cowpeas next to them, my Mitchell family cream peas, are putting on some fruit for me, some some beans, and I'm harvesting that. Cucumbers this year did well. Um, they also were the object of a spider mite assault. I mean, this year has been one problem after the other. It's been, if I was really just depending on my garden, it would have been an awful year. Uh, what makes my year happy for me is that I've been able to demonstrate a lot of things for, for you guys on YouTube. But uh, in terms of production, it's been pretty low. I got enough cucumbers off my cucumber trellis to do one batch of pickles, and I could have done some more but the spider mites uh, had stunted the growth of my vines and taken out one completely. So uh, I didn't really have the performance this year that I had, uh, I had in previous years. And I took the cucumbers out because they were succumbing to the heat and to the powdery mildew. You're gonna get powdery mildew no matter what. And people were asking me, why didn't you try this or did do this milk treatment or do this treatment or that treatment? I don't have the time for that, it's too hot. And I have other things to put in that spot for the summer that I needed to get going. So. That's why I didn't bother with, uh, you know, trying to remedy those those attacks on the cucumber. Plus, I don't like cucumbers. I only like pickles. And so, uh, the family that my son and I usually give all our cucumbers to and our surplus to was out of town for three weeks, and so we didn't have a chance to give away a lot of our cucumbers. So they found their way into the compost, and that's fine too. You know, growing my own compost is is perfectly acceptable. 
Uh, my herbs, all my herbs did very well. I managed to grow rosemary. I was worried this year that I couldn't grow rosemary because I've never been able to grow it very well in the past. I've been eating tons of rosemary from our herbs, uh, from our herb garden. Uh, my basil is doing fantastic. I've managed to keep my basil from bolting to seed this year by using it and trimming it and pinching it. And I keep my basil under my water faucet, so you probably has, haven't seen much of it. Uh, my water spigot where the hose attaches leaks, and so every time I water the garden, it leaks into the basil, and the basil gets a drink. So it's been doing really well this year. Uh, all my other herbs have, have performed pretty well. I've been, uh, been pleased with them, so herbs are easy. It's hard to, hard to go wrong with herbs. Uh, I planted corn this year as a remediation crop, and the corn did well until the storm came uh, last week blew all my corn flat and uh, knocked it all down. I've stood some of it back up and some of it has stood up on its own. But uh, my taller corn, the colorful corn, Wade's Indian corn that I really wanted to, to have a crop from and was giving me a, beginning to give me a crop, uh, most of that's dead. I'm going to leave it laying there for a little while till I decide what to do because I've got beans growing up in, in the midst of that corn as well. And I'd like to see if I can harvest some of those beans. Uh, my muscadine, my mini vineyard, my micro vineyard, is doing well. I've harvested seven pounds of muscadines and I've, and I've only taken in about half of the harvest from those vines. It's still ripening up. So that's uh, this has been my first year of muscadine success and it was the year I expected success because three years ago when I planted the bare root vines and they were, they were literally about this long and then had about that much root uh, behind the vine, um, I knew that the first and second years were training years to get the vines up to the wire and down the trellis wire. And then the, the, second, the second year was also a pruning year where I was trimming them up and shaping them and getting uh, as many fruiting branches as I could. And this year I've, done, uh, I've seen the, the fruit of that. So it's been, been a good year for muscadines. Uh, my other fruit is the fig. I love figs. I've got 35 varieties of figs now. And they're all doing well. They're starting to become heat stressed as they always do at this time of year. And people say, well, why don't you put up a shade cloth? Why don't you put up a, at least, you know, an easy up or something and put your figs under there? You've got that nice little fig deck. You could put an easy up over it. Well, I had planned on doing that, but the storm that knocked my corn down also destroyed my easy up that was over at my son's house. And so, uh, so that, that plan is out. But that happens every year, though, with the figs. The sun gets them. It, the sun weakens them and they become susceptible to disease like uh, the, the rust and, and, and various things that, that figs get. And my little uh, Celeste fig bush out front of my house is uh, looking pretty pathetic right now. In fact, it's, it's, it's lost almost all of its leaves and I took the opportunity to get in and do some summer pruning. They say you shouldn't prune a tree in the summer, uh, but you can actually. I've been reading a book called Grow a Small Fruit Tree and summer pruning actually stunts growth and that's what I want with my fig tree. It's, it's big enough, I don't want it any bigger, I don't want it getting taller where I can't harvest the, the fruit and so I took the opportunity to do some summer pruning just a little bit and to make some decisions on where I want my fig tree to stop growing and we'll see if that works uh, this spring. Uh, the fig trees will often push out another set of leaves when the weather cools down and then you've got another flush of fruit that tries to come in before winter sets in and so sometimes sometimes in December you get actually some figs in, in my backyard not many most of the figs end up dropping off in the in the winter but then they go dormant so that's an update on the figs remember that tiger stripe I was looking at nope didn't get to taste it that's all my tiger stripe figs this year have been eaten by birds and I think it's because they're bright yellow and the birds see them and that's what happens. I do have a dog that would eat this. Want a bite, huh? Want a bite? Composting. This year I built a compost bin, and the reason I built it, I stated, was I need a lot of compost because I can no longer trust outside sources for compost, for manure, for mulch, for things like that. So I thought if I'm going to do compost, I got to go big. And so I built myself a three bin system. And that three bin system has been serving me very well. It's churning away. It's 140 degrees even right now. And I've been adding all kinds of crazy things to my compost and making compost videos. Uh, man, I love compost. I love to make compost and I love the results. And so um, as it is now, I'll have plenty of compost for side dressings for my 
uh, fall garden that will start in uh, the end of August and, and through September I'll be sowing and planting in, in, in the fall. And I'll have plenty of compost there, but I have not used all three bins of my composting system. In fact, I'm still using just one. I've been turning and amending uh, and adding to that one compost pile, but everything down on the bottom layer, about a foot deep, so I've got uh, four by four, so I've got 16 square feet of good compost down there that's, that's pretty much done. And on top of that, I've been adding more. So there's another, another two feet of compost in there that, I, that is still cooking and working its way. Who knows how much I'll have, we'll see. But uh, yeah, I've really been enjoying composting. I've also been enjoying the, the anaerobic compost tea that I've been making. This is David the Goods fetid fertilizer that he learned from several sources, including uh, I think Steve Solomon might have been one of them. But also uh, JDAM, JADAM or JDAM uh, methods in Korea. It's what we're doing here. Where They've been doing that for thousands of years is taking the, the weeds and the and all kinds of whatever biological stuff you've got, shoving it into a barrel and covering it with water and letting it rot. I mean, it's rotting. All the all the all the nutrients are staying in there, um, and that makes you a compost tea that you can dilute and use as a fertilizer. That stuff has been nasty. Man, it smells so bad that I I, I can almost not be around it. But um, as it rots down, the smell abates a little bit, but, uh, but once you, and, and once you dilute it, it, it doesn't stink as much anymore. But it's been very good stuff. I've been impressed. It's kept pace with fish fertilizer, and it's totally free. And it's a way I can keep nutrients from my weeds and from my yard uh, here in my property and not throw them away. I can just take those nutrients right back out of those weeds and put them back into my garden in a way that the plants really appreciate. So that's been really a, a good thing to learn this year. And I intend to up my production of fetid fertilizer next year with a 55 gallon barrel full of it. So um, I'm looking forward to that. I'm not looking forward to, to stirring it around every now and then, but hey, you know, things we do for gardening. Uh, my amino pyrrolid summary. This year, if you haven't known, uh, if you haven't seen any of my videos before, I brought in herbicide into my garden in an, in an unknowing manner. I brought in some hay. My son and I went out and got some hay to use as mulch as we've done every year in the past. Bermuda coastal hay, it's a hybrid, it doesn't seed, and if it does seed, the seeds don't germinate, so perfectly fine to use as mulch, really good stuff. And I think it looks good in a vegetable garden. Unfortunately this year, my hay was tainted with herbicide, aminopyrrolid herbicide, probably Grazon or some, some other Dow chemical brand name for their aminopyrrolids. And what amino pyrrolid does is it is it affects only broadleaf plants like weeds, uh, dichotomous plants. That means when they when they sprout, they have two leaves. A monocot like grass is is, is not affected by it. And so you can spray it on your your straw, your hay field, your grass fields, whatever, and um, it doesn't kill the grass. It just kills all that you know milkweed and all the all the weeds growing in it that you don't want in your hay. Okay, fine. That's a noble pursuit. You want to get your weeds out of there. Use technology. The problem is this herbicide is persistent and it doesn't break down. In fact, cows can eat that stuff with a matter of weeks. It can go through the cow's digestive tract. It can be uh, put out as manure and that manure can be composted and left for a year and that herbicide is still in there and still deadly. And so I brought that in on my hay. And my hay had obviously been sprayed. Put it on my tomato plants and it stunted them, it deformed them and you can go back and watch the videos. So that was a big deal and it was a big part of this year's YouTube uh, season was to expose that and to teach about it and talk about it and show my experience with it. And so what happened was I had to come up with a way to remediate that and get it out of my garden. So I thought bio, a, a, a biomass that would pull that up and store it in its leaves would be good. I thought corn, corn is a monocot. Monocots are not affected by this amino pyrrolid. So I planted corn in my garden with a th with the thinking that it would draw up all that into its into its leaves, I could chop it down later and discard it and at, at least help some to draw out some of that herbicide from my garden. And so I grew corn. The corn grew fabulously. I thought if I'm going to grow corn, I want corn I can use. I can't eat it. I don't want to eat grazon. So I grew ornamental corn, and we were going to use that as ornaments. Well, the storm broke down my corn. I just talked about that, but um, but but I think it worked because I planted beans, which are a dicot and a very sensitive dicot to amino pyrrolid herbicide. So I planted these beans within my corn as a bioassay, as a test crop to see 
Are the leaves going to deform on those beans? That would tell me I still have herbicide. If they grew up normally, if they grew up healthy, then I've probably remediated most of the herbicide out of that soil. Well, the beans came up just fine. So fortunately, I had either a light case of aminopyrrolid uh, uh, tainting this year, uh, or my corn was uh, heavy and big and massive enough to pull up all that was in there. So now I've got a bed that I can use in the fall and I can pull that corn out and I can really work over that soil and, and uh, put something new in there. So I think that my amino pyrrolid episode of 2019 has finally come to a close and I'm going to call it a victory because not only did we learn, but we, div we, we practiced a method that I learned about that helps to remediate and I've shared about that method. So I lost all my tomatoes. Uh, I lost my, my crop of tomatoes this year but I was able to learn something in the, in the process that has been valuable and hopefully helpful for you as well. Environmental challenges. This year has been uh, a rough year environmentally. We have had all kinds of infestations of, of harmful bugs. We had the spider mite. Uh, spider mites nearly wiped out my whole garden. They started in my perpetual spinach, which I had planted last spring and the perpetual spinach grew through the year, grew through the winter, and came back this spring, and I was really excited about it until I discovered spider mites growing in my perpetual spinach. Those spider mites, I didn't jump on them right away with neem oil, and they spread to my cucumbers and to my squash, and, and all over the garden there were spider mites everywhere. So I had to deal with those spider mites with uh, neem oil, which effectively eliminated them quite, quite, uh, quite handily, got rid of them. But, um, but that, was a, that stunted my garden and took away about a month worth of growing that I had to basically start over. So all the plants that had been damaged and knocked back had to grow back and all those plants that had been killed I had to replace. Um, it's been a hot year. It's not, not been a too hot year, but the summer's really brutal and it's knocking things down now. So uh, that's, that's normal here though. That's why we take a break in the summer. Uh, we've had some storm damage and had some uh, pretty hefty storms throughout the spring that uh, were a challenge but uh, for the most part my environmental challenges this year have only been insects. My squash, especially my pumpkins, have succumbed to vine borers. I learned, I had planted some pumpkin pits and I showed you guys how to plant a pumpkin pit and those pumpkins came up, man they were beautiful, they thrived, they sent out vines everywhere, luscious, it was a picture perfect experiment of how to plant a pumpkin pit until the vine borers showed up. That variety I had over there had a Jaradale and a Moringa pumpkin, and those were Cucurbita maxima. And I had read, or I had been told by David DeGood, that uh, hey man, those maximas are susceptible to vine borers, and also they don't root as well along their vine, and that's going to be trouble. Well, sure enough, it was. In fact, the, the vine borers got hold of those plants, and within a couple of days, the whole vines were dead. All of them were dead, so, so I don't have those anymore. But I did plant, when I learned that Cucurbita maximas were susceptible to vine borers, I thought, well, I'll get the Cucurbita moschata, which is uh, a little bit more resistant to vine borers and more prone to send roots down wherever the vine touches the dirt. And so far, it looks like it's working. There's vine borer damage all over those Cucurbita uh, moschatas. I've got um, a, couple of, uh, a couple of varieties, two varieties, a French variety and a um, Korean variety, Japanese variety. Uh, over in my bed there and they're still alive they're really suffering in the heat I mean they wilt down and look like they're dying and they're screaming for water uh, when the Sun goes down they perk back up and so I'm just gonna see how they do and hopefully they make it through August and September and in the fall maybe they'll uh, maybe they'll surprise me I don't know we'll see so that's the update on my pumpkins but also that's one of my environmental challenges has been the vine borers I haven't had many caterpillars this year. I don't, I don't usually have uh, uh, bug infestations. And uh, I did find my first hornworm this year, tomato hornworm, but dealt with that one swiftly. So uh, yeah, my environmental ch challenges have been uh, average this year. And so for that, I'm thankful. I also did a, uh, an experiment this spring to eliminate nut sedge. In my bed number three, which is the farthest one in my, in my garden, I had nut sedge that was out of control and I thought, you know, we're going to try an experiment this year and see if we can kill off that nut sedge because you can't really pull it up unless you, uh, you know, you, you sift the whole garden by hand and pull up all the networks of nut sedge down in there. 
And so in that video, uh, my son and I laid down some molasses powder, some industrial molasses powder, and then covered the whole garden bed with cardboard, a, a pretty thick layer of cardboard. And the hopes were that the molasses would really uh, jump start the biological activity in that soil. Uh, all that bacteria down there would get to work munching and reproducing and and uh, getting real dense in terms of its uh, vigorousness. <laughs> and it would consume what was left of the roots down there of my nut sedge. So um, also the cardboard laying on top would help smother nut that nut sedge because nut sedge is so so tough it, it it permeates mulch it grows through mulch it grows through uh, weed barrier cloth and but it doesn't grow through cardboard and so if I could smother it those shoots that are trying to grow and find their way around under that cardboard would deplete the little nut that has all the energy in it along the root system and depleting that uh, by by smothering the weeds of light and the action of the bacteria eating all those roots down there that die off hopefully would eliminate nut sedge. So has it worked? Well, the cardboard is still down. There's a layer of mulch on top of it. And I decided that that's where I was gonna grow my pumpkins. And so I cut holes, three of them, and planted my cucurbita machada pumpkin vines in there. And so far, I haven't seen any uh, significant nut sedge growth come up. Every now and then you find a shoot, but nothing significant, nothing like I would have expected. I also pulled up some of the cardboard and took a look around and didn't see but uh, dried up runners and dried up roots, but I didn't see a lot of signs that it had been uh, thriving down there. And so I think, and I'll let you know more in the fall when I pull it all up and replant the whole thing, I think that it's been successful at least in knocking back the nut sedge in a significant way. So um, all that cardboard is, is mostly breaking down now, at least on the underside, the worms are enjoying it, and so it's gonna end up being uh, amended into the soil but uh, I think that I think that experiment was a success at least I'm going to call it that until I take a closer look and I'll let you know future plans um, our fall garden this year uh, according to my uh, timetables published by our our local extensions uh, my gardening will begin in earnest in September but I'll begin starting seeds later this uh, later in August later uh, this month and I'll begin starting seeds for uh, my uh, indoors and I'll show you how to do that. that that'll really kind of launch off the fall gardening season when I show you how to start seeds, at least how I do it, indoors. Now I've never started seeds indoors. I've always started seeds on my, on my seed starting table here in the garage. But when I do that, it's, it's late winter, early spring and it's cool in the garage. Right now it gets up to 145 degrees in here during the height of the day. I can't start seeds out here anymore. So I'm going to have to transport that into my, uh, my loft in my house and we'll start seeds there. I'll show you how to do that. Um, we're going to have some crop sowing videos in the fall, uh, seed starting videos. <coughs> we're going to continue to look at our compost and learn about composting. We're going to uh, build a water collection system. And I had hoped to do that in the summer, but man, I tell you, it's too hot for me to go out there and work these days and enjoy myself and make a video that uh, is uh, compelling. I'd just be a cranky old fart, so I'm not going to do that. I'll do it in the in the fall, uh, which is kind of sad because man, we had a big that big thunderstorm would have filled those barrels up. But anyway, I'm, I'm still doing a little bit of research now on, on the best way I want to uh, the best system and the one that will work for me. But I'll show you how to do that. So that's what's going on here. That's the 2019 spring and summer update, and that's pretty much it for this spring and summer garden. Anything that's left over when we start our fall garden, I'll show you. Probably show you how I remove the things, how I prepare the beds, and uh, you'll see an update at that point. Until then, my gardening updates will be sparse. Whenever it's not so hot, I'll go outside and show you some videos. But uh, as you have noticed, if you follow my channel, you get a video about once a week, maybe once every two weeks in the, in the, in the heat of summer. Um, that's just because it's time, to, it's time to go indoors. It's time to stay inside. So I won't be doing a whole lot of videos until we really amp up the fall garden. But I do thank you so much for watching our videos. I'm so grateful for the comments and the banter back and forth in the, in the comment section. Thank you all so much for the encouraging remarks. Uh, it means a lot to me, and I thank you for watching my videos. This has been a good year for my YouTube channel. I hope the next year is even better, and, uh, well, that's what I'm hoping for. Thanks a lot. We'll see you, um, we'll see you soon.
Take care. Bye-bye.